It's great to be here. It's great to see so many familiar faces, uh, thanks to my wife's uh, Facebook uh, posts, and she's basically my publicity agent. Uh, so I'll just start off with a short, some short comments in the introduction, and also a couple of uh, quotes or some writings from the two of the people that I uh, interviewed. Uh, this is from the introduction. <clears throat> the Vietnamese called it the American War. The Americans called it the Vietnam War. At the center of that war was the Tet Offensive of 1968 called Tet Mau Tan by the Vietnamese. Defining Battle of Tet was the attack on the American Embassy in Saigon, where 16 Viet Dong Rangers, Special Assault Forces, including a man named Ba Den, blew a three-foot hole in the impregnable embassy wall, entered the compound, and engaged in a six-hour firefight that left 13 attackers dead, along with five U.S. soldiers. For Americans, the cataclysmic shock of the countrywide Tet attacks, and particularly the embassy attack, were a turning point in their support of the war, especially after the often repeated promise of the light at the end of the tunnel that predicted victory. In 1968, I was an analyst and interrogator linguist, part of Company A, the 519th MI Battalion. I worked out of a joint U.S. prisoner of war compound called the Combined Military Interrogation Center, located in Cholon, Saigon, down the street from Plantation Road, just down from Tonsignot Air Force Base. It was near the Futuwa racetrack. In February of 1968, while on night duty at CMIC, I was assigned to interrogate a wounded prisoner of war, Ba Din, who was one of the Biet Dong commanders and one of three survivors of the embassy attack. It was because of that interaction and the significance of the Tet attacks, especially the Saigon attacks, and in particular that I returned to Vietnam in 2013 after an absence of 45 years. I wanted to see if Ba Den was still alive and to meet this now famous soldier. So I, there's a more detailed account of how I got to actually talk to the, the, uh, the sources for these uh, interviews. But I'm not going to read that. I'll let you guys. It, it was actually a, an interesting story and, and a good example of how uh, chance and luck uh, plays in life. Um, Going to need some, read some um, narratives from Nguyen Hu Loi, who was a Viet Dong soldier. Uh, he was born in Quang Du Hamlet in uh, Quang Nam Province. His, mother was a fa his father was a farmer and my mother was a vendor. I have two older brothers and two sisters. I'm the youngest child in my family. Before the collective uprising of 1960, both my brothers served in the Republic of Vietnam Army. They were drafted. But they also joined the revolutionary moment, movement locally. My second brother was a paratrooper in the Republic of Vietnam Army. When he and his wife had two children, he was allowed to quit the army and come back to his hometown to farm, as he requested. And this story is very common to many of the families and people who lived in South Vietnam. They were spread over both sides of the conflict on uh, RVN and DRV. Beginning a story with his service with the Viet Dong, Loy first explained that his family joined the Viet Minh and played an active role during the years of the anti-French war. My mother hid and took care of the soldiers in 1953 when my siblings and I were little, still little children. We sang and danced for the soldiers every evening and acted as guides in local areas. Before joining the Viet Dong, I came to Saigon in 1959 and stayed in my aunt's house. Loy went on to describe some of his training and uh, uh, the attacks that he was uh, trained to do. Bef describing the actual attacks, Loy wanted me to understand that he and many other NLF soldiers considered white U.S. soldiers to be invaders. But they preferred not to kill black American servicemen because they were former slaves. Before attacking the U.S. Army as directed by our superiors, we signed the sacrifice letter because we were in a sacrifice unit. This was an interesting mark to, to me because in the line of duty, I had a 
interrogated one of the survivors of the embassy attack. In the US press, that attack was widely described as a suicide attack. Though in my inter interrogation report, it was not described as such. One of the things that he, would, uh, the main thing that he was uh, famous for is that he planned to attack Harkin, McNamara, and some other uh, US officials to uh, ambush them, blow them up. Uh, their original plan was to rent a house along McNamara's route, and that actually was, was changed. So he actually planned to attack this convoy at the Congley Bridge in May 1964. Loy's partner was Nguyen Hu Loy, excuse me, Nguyen Van Troy. They'd already laid two mines there, each about eight kilos. Troy went to check the detonator wires attached to the bombs and was noticed, uh, noticed by two local people who thought he was a thief and called the police. Loy, who was a lookout for the operation, also was captured. Other two members of the team escaped. Loy asked Troy to take, let me take all the blame. He, because he was married while I was not, but he did not agree. He said that if I took the blame, both of us would be killed then no one would be able, be able to continue the revolutionary path. If he took all the blame, I would be given a lighter sentence and could continue the stu struggle. I was sent to prison in May 1964 to, together with Troy for the assassination, assassination attempt. I was moved to Condal Prison in se September 1964 and released 10 years later. Troy was sentenced to death but got a reprieve, brief reprieve after the FALN a Venezuelan communist organization, guerrilla group, kidnapped Lieutenant Colonel Michael Smolin in revenge for Troy's sentence. The group threatened to kill the American if Troy was executed. Smolin was eventually released unharmed, but Troy was shot by a fire squad shortly thereafter in Chihua Prison, October 15th. In night, Troy became the first publicly executed member of the Southern Resistance. His execution was filmed, incidentally, that's online, and he remained defiant to the end. His last words to correspondents before his execution in Saigon were, you are journalists, and so you must be well informed about what is happening. It is the Americans who have committed aggression against our country. It is they who have been killing our people with planes and bombs. I have never acted against the will of my people. It is against the Americans that I have taken action. When a priest offered him abolition, he refused, saying, I have committed no sin. It is the Americans who have sinned. As the first shots were fired, he called, Long live Vietnam. His picture graces a postage stamp in Vietnam. As the interview ended, I, I asked Loy if he had anything to add. He said, Vietnam is a special nation, very special nation. We are kind and good hard natured but over the course of history, everyone, whether they are young or old, stands against all invaders. Everyone is responsible for protecting his country. We just fight against the invaders. Now the US and Vietnam are friends. Let bygones be bygones. However, I also want to mention the severe aftermath of the Vietnam War, which is Agent Orange. I visit my friends sometimes and see their children and grandchildren. They are heavily affected by Agent Orange. They are very pitiful. Throughout the interview, Loy was a very warm and energetic person. I gave him a Veterans for Peace button and brochure and he reciprocated generously with a large picture, framed picture of himself and Troy, the picture that shows them after their capture. The second person I'm gonna quote is a woman, one of three women that I interviewed for this job, for this uh, book. These were all very competent soldiers. And uh, if you were walking down a dark alley, you'd be well served by having one of these women with you. Quan says, when I was little, I liked poetry. So my mother taught me how to read so that I could read epic poems such as Luc Van Tien and Tak San Li Tong. By the time I went to the village school, I already knew how to read. 
I quit after being in school for a few months. I wanted to be a courier for the revolution. Actually, as a woman, I only wanted peace in place of war, compassion in place of animosity, <coughs> happiness in place of suffering. It was only because of my homeland that I could not have these things that I had to quit school to join the revolution. Yes. Sure. Troy Kwan uh, says, my family has, has five children. My father was a farmer, but he was also very good with martial arts, like his father. Um, my father went north in 1954, which is known as Topkat. Many so so South Vietnamese went north, tens of thousands of them, as part of the Geneva Accords. Uh, my mother went to the regrouping location also, but was assigned to stay south. She stayed with her three little children. My big, two big brothers also regrouped to the north like my father. Because of the failure of the Geneva Convention Agreement, Quan did not see her father and brothers again until after liberation in 1975. So she didn't see her father for 30 years. My mother participated in the revolution since 1946. She goes on to talk about working in the uh, working with her mother and transporting weapons, explosives, and sl supplies for the revolutionary forces, and also acting as a courier and intelligence agent. The area around Canto prior to 1954 had been partly controlled by the revolution, which had redistributed, redistributed to the peasants some of the land that had belonged to the property owners who followed the French. After 1954, the landowners returned and with Diem's Diem soldiers used harsh and violent reprisals, including killings, beheadings, torture, and exile against the revolutionaries who had stayed in the South. Quan was forced to witness such killings, including that of a revolutionary soldier who was captured. Diem's soldiers said, if you say down with Ho Chi Minh and long live Nong Dinh Diem, then we will re release you. The revolutionary soldiers said, long live Ho Chi Minh, down with Nogan Dinh Diem. Uh, I'm not going to read you what the rest of these. It's, it's sort of a, uh, some of the descriptions in these, in these uh, are, are quite vivid. In the middle of her narrative about training and tactics, Quan unexpectedly and voluntarily said, even during the time I participated in my struggle to re resist the American invasion of the Saigon, I knew that in America there were people fighting against the war in Vietnam, including soldiers. Good people were forced to join the war. Many mothers mourned their lost sons in the war. I love them. Her remarks were the clearest and most sincere expression I heard regarding the lack of rancor most Vietnamese feel towards American. During phase one of the Tet Offensive, she was involved in offensive operations around uh, uh, Quang Trung Square, and she was actually involved in, in a, she was wounded. That was during Tet, 1968. Later, phase two, in May, she was led several batter, battles in uh, um, Day Tom Street, the old District 2. She said, we rolled, uh, we used bunkers there were many large sewer tunnels along the side of the road. We used them like bunkers to avoid firepower. We also rolled them out to block the enemy vehicles. District 2 was the central district of Sa Saigon back then. The Saigon government and military surrounded us and counterattacked to protect their headquarters. After attacking our target, we were surrounded and re retreated slowly into 83 Day Tom Street. The enemy continued to close in on us. On the very last day, I and two other people, Sister Le Ti Bak Kat and our young scout Nguyen Van Quang, only 15 years old, were injured. We voluntarily exposed ourselves and intentionally drew enemy fire towards us so that our teammates could retreat. My injured arm was dangling and bleeding profusely. I applied a tourniquet to reduce the bleeding and decided to cut off the crushed part of the arm so that it would be less of a hindrance. 
On the hand of the injured arm, there was a ring my mother had given me only a few days before. I was about to take the ring off to keep it as a souvenir for my mother, but then I thought my life would be sacrificed anyway, so I did not take it off. We sat back to back each, to each other, trying to hold out. Finally, having run out of ammunition, I was captured and immediately taken in for interrogation. At the special police department for District 2, they tortured me by beating on my wounds. In the moments when I thought I couldn't escape death, I wrote down a few lines of poetry to send my mother. And this is actually a poem she wrote in 1975. I'll see if I can get through this without. I am a soldier in prison in the front line. Even though the chains gash my arms and legs, the crushing interrogation leaves me half here, half there. Followed by threats of ruthless blows, the enemy burns our wounds, the room thick with smoke. My prison mates, their eyes blazing. Hold me, I give them a smile. In a circle of interrogation, they never let up. The floor black, stained with blood, and still my blood spills bright red. If I'm missing on the day of victory, mother, please lift your head. Look at the country. I will follow the red black <coughs> back to you. She wrote a bunch of poetry, more than that, which is included in the book. She was actually very, she has a book of poetry that was published in Vietnam. I read a short thing. Let's see how we're doing for time. Okay. Um, Mui Tan was another one of these people that I talked to who sort of immediately bonded. Uh, he was uh, joined uh, as an undercover spy, really. He joined the uh, Arvin Navy, the South Vietnamese Navy. And uh, he had several wives. His first wife that he married, he didn't tell her that he was part of the revolutionary movement. When she found out, she, she flipped out and went back to her village. So she was frightened, understandably so. Uh, and then in 1973, with the uh, Paris Peace, Peace Accords, he re continued his resistance with the, with the, uh, as an undercover sailor. In, uh, then in 1975, with the liberation of, uh, of uh, the country, and particularly Saigon, imminent, his second wife, who also he did not tell that he was a member of the resistance, was freaking out with along with her, her uh, friends about uh, that they thought that because they had painted nails, the, the communists were going to tear her fingernails out. And then he said, no, he says, that's not going to happen. He showed him his K-54 pistol, which is a Chinese communist uh, firearm, unmasking himself as an undercover uh, Viet Dong agent. Mui Tan was smiling as he recalled this incident. His second wife later died, and when he met for the interview, he was with another woman, a retired army officer. So, one of the telling remarks was a quote that I got from Thomas A. L. Ahern, Jr., who wrote a book called Vietnam De Declassified. And do you want to follow up that and sort of uh, read that and uh, comment on the uh, citation? So we want to? Yeah. How much time do we have? Oh, we got a half an hour. Before question and answer. Oh, five, ten minutes, ten minutes. Okay. <laughs> He's a, he's a professor, so you don't well, have to hold him down. I'm very used to talking. <laughs> so I, I try to shut up. Um, first of all, it's great to be here. Uh, this has been a long time coming, uh, and it's wonderful to have it in my hands. Um, congratulations to you, Mike, for, for this really remarkable achievement. And, um, you know, it's, a, it's an extremely touching story, too, to... Uh, to see this kind of, uh, you know, karmic uh, coincidence uh, in the Saigon post office where Mike, who is on his own little journey of coming to terms with, with his war experiences, runs into somebody who connects him with people that are germane at the core of his war experiences. It's just mind-boggling to, to think about this. 
And out of this, after many trials and tribulations, comes this book, and I'm very happy to um, to be commenting on it and, and talking to uh, Mike about it. I wanted to start with um, Mike's decision uh, to um, have a quote by Thomas Ahern, who is a, um, as far as I know, a CIA historian. CIA has its own in in-house hi history section, and um, he wrote this book, Vietnam Declassified, and Mike. Um, uh, you know, quotes him in, in the very beginning of the book, and let me just read this and uh, use that as kind of our hook for our uh, conversation here. Um, and Thomas Ahern says, it is clear now, although then obscured by American ideological perceptions, transitory government of Vietnam successes, by which he means the Saigon government, and also the communists' own weaknesses, uh, that the Viet Cong succeeded by exploiting the social and economic legacy of the colonial period. Only a collapse of communist will to win could have altered the outcome, and that will never faltered. The North Vietnamese tanks rolling into Saigon on 30 April 1975 sealed a victory that the southern insurgents had won more than a decade before. I think that's a very, very pertinent quote um, because it really speaks to the um, deficits uh, that we still have in this country in talking about the Vietnam War, which is very much kind of um, uh, juiced down to a very simplistic binary, North versus South. Um, and uh, this book by Mike on uh, Southern Voices by Viet Cong really explodes these kind of simplistic ways in which we discuss the war. So I want to ask you about this quote. What drew you to it? Well, it's a thick book, and it was the last paragraph of the book. You know, and if you're, if you're reading a book like that, you sort of skip around, and then that thing just, bang, it, uh, uh, it uh, caught my attention, and, and it's, it uh, crystallized what I, as a, uh, an interrogator talking to prisoners of war in 1968, and then later on, 50-some uh, years later, talking to, as a civilian, talking to civilian soldiers too, and that uh, the re respect and, and uh, deference and, uh, that I had in 1968 was repeated by these soldiers, and it says, you know, that they were nationalists, patriotic nationalists, and they, they go out of their way to say that so much. A couple of the old timers here are very proud of their 60-year Communist Party pin, pins, but for most of these soldiers it was like a, a uh, very proud of what they had done and they're tenacious and, and uh, well trained and as the other people in the book talk about their, their, their training and the, the support that they had with the revolution, it's very clear that uh, you know they were successful in what they were doing. And the, uh, well, one of the things that's kind of a little bit of a sidetrack was that, is that as an order of battle interrogator, that basically is you find out, you uh, find out how many people were in your unit, where the unit were, what kind of weapons you have, really basic intelligence, which is critical understanding. And I was one of the bunch of lower ranking NCOs that provided that information to the analysts and then up the chain of command to the MACV Central Command. That information was disregarded, uh, discarded, and uh, um, ignored so that when the shit hit the fan with the Tet Offensive and there 30 to 50,000 uh, uh, NLF soldiers almost all invaded uh, and attacked almost every provincial capital in South Vietnam, they asked, well, where did these people come from? Well, the answer was they were there all along. And Westmoreland was one of those people who says, we're going to kill our way to victory. But he did that by, by deliberately falsifying the numbers of actual combat-ready soldiers they were. And one last sort of thing, the, you can see how, how, um, how effective soldiers determined, very, you know, are with, with minimal amount of training, of the 16 people who attacked the American embassy, they were short of... Uh, people, and they sort of did this as an ad hoc thing, believe it or not, to attack the American embassy, and they, they were cooks and, and, and clerks, typists, on, on that attacking force. 
but they were confident enough and brave enough to do what they did. So the idea that um, you had to have main force South Vietnamese or uh, uh, Vietnamese uh, Nam Nam soldiers doing the work, the, and often their regional forces and their militia forces were quite effective. Another thing that I'll mention before I commit is that if you've got some time, look up and read about the Battle of Apak, which was a 1963, I think, it was a it was it was a battle where a couple of uh, companies of NLF soldiers held off a, a two battalions of Arvin soldiers, shot down five helicopters, and that example of the battle, they, they carried their dead off. There were three, they killed 50, 60 or 50 or 60 Arvin. That sort of lesson, uh, John Paul Van, who was one of the more well-known uh, uh, people in, uh, as an advisor, they didn't learn from that. That was early in the war and says, uh-oh, these people are very serious and they're very competent. Oh. Wasn't he circling the battlefield? Yeah, he was, he was an American advisor uh, to the Ar Arvin uh, uh, battalion and uh, urging him forward. But, you know, the lessons learned there could have been learned, they didn't learn them. And so uh, from that on, I mean, there was, I don't know, hundreds of thousands of Vietnamese killed after that and uh, 30 or 40,000 more Americans. So. Uh, I don't know. Does so that what Thomas Ahern is saying here is basically that the war, the outcome of the war, was decided about ten years prior, not seventy-five, but in you know latest by nineteen sixty-four. And we should remember that the so-called North Vietnamese Army, another term that is really loaded, the, the People's Army of Vietnam, uh, only went back south. Um, in uh, the first units uh, come down uh, in late 1964. Um, and a southern resistance that was uh, basically on its own. There was very little logistical and um, uh, uh, supply support from the northern zone of Vietnam held its own against a highly militarized um, uh, Republic of Vietnam supported by 27,000 yeah. American advisors. So these were uh, really uh, very rudimentary resistance forces and that they were able to uh, hold about one third of the territory south of the DMZ by 1963 is just mind boggling. Uh, you know, and I added that as, a, as one of the things in order to better interrogate, you talk about what kind of weapons you had. So I was talking about pe with these people, this was 1967, 68, and these units that were uh, operating in the earlier 60s, they had this hodgepodge collection of, of armaments, including, well, I mentioned to Kurt, Kurt, uh, Christoph, it says they even had a German assault rifle, which is, I don't know, how'd you get that? Uh, uh, Japanese firearms, American firearms, Chinese firearms, uh, but as Christoph said, mentioned, he says they managed to actually use those effectively. And matter of fact, in the Battle of Apak, these people were, who were the soldiers were using, were using um, red stock rifles, which is a semi-automatic rifle. They knew how to aim at the tail, spin, tail rotor of a helicopter and shoot it down. You shoot that down, it comes down. So, I mean. They were very proficient with what they had. They used TNT. Uh, it was only later that they were able to get, as the French call it, uh, Le Plastique, C4, and uh, uh, very competent, very competent soldiers. Uh, and sex was no barrier to be that competency. So let me say a few words why this book is uh, such a revelation, um, because um, we have to understand that the Southern resistance, which Thomas Ahern, and I totally agree, claims was at the core of the ultimate outcome of 1975. Um, we have to understand that the Southern resistance is actually the least understood of all the parties in the Vietnam War. Um, for one reason, because uh, the United States framed the war as a simplistic binary between an anti-communist South, which was supp supposedly an innocent victim 
of an aggressive North Vietnam, a communist North Vietnam. Um, uh, and uh, the uh, Vietnamese uh, exile community um, uh, in their anti-communist stance uh, has oftentimes adopted this kind of simplistic binary and they're talking about the South Vietnamese uh, by which they mean only the anti-communist South, South Vietnamese side. Now, so there's no real incentive, so to say, to give these people a voice because they tend to undermine the simplistic binary. But it's getting more complicated too because after 1975, these southerners were oftentimes marginalized by the victorious Hanoi-based regime uh, because Vietnamese communism is much more based in the north and in the center of the country than in the south. And the Vietnamese Communist Party, after 1975, wanted to take all the credit for the victory over the United States and the Republic to themselves. And so they didn't have much of an incentive to actually give credit to the southern resistance, which oftentimes ideologically was much more broad-based revolutionary and not just the Communist Party. Right? And so Mike's book is really preaching into this and giving us these important voices of people that are the most marginalized in all of these reams of books that we have on the Vietnam War. Uh, they are standing in front of us in plain sight, and yet in the framing of the war, rhetorically, they have been hidden for decades. Right? And so uh, this is, I think, the biggest achievement of your book, that uh, you give voice to Southerners who have struggled really to yeah. have their voices heard, even though they were at the very core of the war. And one of the, one of the things, and I, I learned this it was a comment by one of our one of my, the main one of the main uh, interpreters, translators for this this work, was that uh, Vietnamese, whether they were so-called communists living in the north, although that's a really a, a loose term. Uh, um, Douglas Pike d d described the Vietnamese as very, very poor communists. He was one of the famous anti-communist people himself. But that the Vietnamese, uh, this, this woman that I, I, I knew who helped me out, she just says that when she was in school in the South, they all described, and that was under the re uh, Saigon regime, they all, they all thought that Vietnam was one country. There was no North Vietnam or South Vietnam, and that's true of, of people who lived in the north. Vietnam was one country. They were Vietnamese and it was one country. That's that common sort of perception. There was no North Vietnam or South Vietnam. So. In another aspect of your book is in their, in their kind of short autobiographical sketches, your interviewees oftentimes emphasize how generational their resistance was how they go back yeah. you know, into the great-grandfather generation yeah. sometimes who have been already committed in resisting French colonization. Um, and uh, that, again, is something that in our simplistic ways of thinking about the war as kind of a Northern communist invasion of a, um, of a uh, kind of innocent South Vietnam um, gets lost. That, the Southern resistance had very long and deep roots uh, in the localities. And um, so I really appreciate the kind of granular level that we get out of these interviews, yeah. these small yeah. details about motivations that are not necessarily ideological, but deeply localized, patriotic. Yeah, engineering. that is a common thing. Uh, patriotism and, and nationalism is a common thread, and they all, Many, uh, most of these people that I talk to, as do many Vietnamese, they know their history and they know their heroes. <coughs> Tran Hung Dao, the Trung sisters, uh, you know, these are all national history. I mean, the Vietnam is one of the few countries that actually repulsed Mongol invasions twice. So they know that history. Actually, Douglas Pike, which I, I just recently read some of him, he, he, just, he described the Vietnamese as the Prussians of Asia. 
uh, because they were very nationalist and very and could be very warlike. And that that's, that that history goes back a long way. Apparently, I mean, the United States and the French, to their sorrow, did not learn this lesson. Um, one of the sort of ironies of, of after the French were there for a hundred years or so, the United States came in there and said, well, you don't know what you're doing, but we can do it better. Um, that didn't work so well. So <laughs> the French actually were fairly competent about many things, but they were on the wrong side of this uh, historical st struggle. I want, I want to ask you another question, and that is, uh, give us a little bit of a sense of how was it coming back? You hadn't been back for 45 years, I think, right? Yeah. Uh, and uh, so 1968 to, to 2013. And um, how was it? Was it kind of a surreal feeling to be back in, in this area, the street in which your barracks were? Uh, which weren't there anymore. Uh, but you, you have a very... They was, it, was, it, was, uh, it was, I guess it's surreal, but I mean, it was... Uh, when I was there, you know, we drove around and op uh, the people in intelligence, we had had to go up to Tonsignot and get maps and go up to uh, Chuhoy compound. So we drove around for the most part in open Jeeps. And uh, every every month or so, not necessarily us, but other GIs in those Jeeps would get grenade tossed in or you get shot. So we'd drive around with a, a rifle in my lap or a, sh or a pistol, which isn't no really any defense against somebody who's going to driving up on a motorcycle and going to shoot you. So uh, that's the sort of stress that, you know, we all had. And when he got back to Vietnam in 19, uh, well, seven, or 2013, Vietnam, the traffic there is just as chaotic as it has always been, it's just chaotic. But there weren't any crazed GIs driving five-ton trucks or two-and-a-half-ton trucks trying to barrel your way through traffic and shouting and cursing at people to get out of the way. There was none of that because there weren't any Americans there. And, uh, and if you've ever been to Vietnam and the traffic is there daunting, but I mean, you can walk out into traffic and walk right through this, like Moses parting the Red Sea, and <laughs> you, you know, you, you walk right through this traffic and nobody hits you, they'll let you do it, you know. So it was, it was calming in that way and they're also, they're very, very young. Uh, uh, that's true now to most of, the, most of the population is under 30. And then the other thing, of course, is that the Vietnamese were so friendly and uh, respectful. They knew a GI says they don't really blame the, lo the low ranking soldiers like myself. And uh, says, we knew that you had to be here and uh, we don't blame you. That, that, that was common enough sort of sentiments. Um, you know, that was, that was, that paved the way for me to go back to Vietnam and to feel comfortable talking to Vietnamese. So, you're dedicating your book to the hundreds of refugee villagers killed in American and Arvin airstrikes on May 7, 1968 in Futuha, near Plantation Road, Jalan, Saigon, next to the barracks of Company A, 15, 519th Military Intelligence Battalion. Yeah. What happened? Well, May 7th, uh, our barracks were, were in a, actually part of our barracks and our perimeter included a village which was mostly refugees immediately next to us. And there was some, uh, some um, activity, some uh, NLF activity in the village. I didn't see very much. But they pulled up a company of Arvin and uh, started to attack the village. And then they called in uh, jets they called in jets and uh, sky raiders were prop driven sky raiders and they dropped 250 and 500 pound bombs on this village. There, this is nothing but thatch, thatch roofs and, and tin roofs and uh, napalm, white phosphorus. And we were sitting in our barracks. I was on top of the uh, barracks, you know, the, those 250, 500 pound bombs are so, so uh, uh, there's so much shrapnel that it hit us, you know, it hit, hit me. I wasn't hurt, but some of our, our people were hurt, but the, it just sprayed the shrapnel. And a 200, 500 pound bomb will spray, spray shrapnel for a, a 500 yards. So, I mean, the Vietnamese in there were, were killed. They were all civilians. And uh, another friend of mine, uh, Wayne Goble, documented this, filming it uh, 
uh, recording it on the uh, on the deck of our uh, barracks before we had to before our first sergeant told everybody to get off the deck because of the shrapnel. And uh, Wayne said it was not my estimate, but he says he says that think there were 200 in, at least 200 in, innocents, and that was true of the rest of of that area of Saigon Cholon, where they it, the place looked like a World War II world, uh, bombed out cities from Europe. It was completely gutted and and people driven out that were ones that weren't killed. Uh, and uh, the last thing about it was, so the, the, which was really heartbreaking, and I've written about it, was that one of the, some of the people brought their wounded to us because they, we knew them. We were actually, we knew these people in the village, talked to them and drank in their little canteens. And, some, and one was a, a, a young girl, maybe 12 or something, and she was very, she was wounded, terribly wounded with shrapnel and napalm. And she died a, a agonizing vocal death right in front of us because we, we had no place to go. We didn't even have any morphine for her. Our medic didn't have any morphine. And um, it, uh, it was a searing experience and something that's probably affected me. It has affected me my, all, my whole life. So that's, uh, that's, the, uh, that's the context of that. Uh, and that sort of thing happened. All, all the time in Vietnam, a sort of random bombing of, uh, they call it these days collateral damage, but it was, it was the way we fought the war, free fire zones. And uh, uh, so that's, that's the context for that particular uh, uh, quote. We probably get her to get to a few, few uh, qu questions if you've got them. We're just about out of time. Um, you can ask me any question you want. Uh, about uh, being an interrogator or an analyst or uh, <laughs> one thing I'll say is you know I was uh, 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 not particularly proud of being in, in the army and what part of what we did in Vietnam but I personally didn't torture anybody but some of my comrades did for many of the South Vietnamese army that was a default option for them um, but it was not uncommon and um, the other thing is that for Americans anyway I, like everybody else who went there, went over, we knew what the Geneva Convention was, and we knew that abusing people was illegal. We knew that. Uh, I carried a Geneva card with me, you know, till almost it about wore out. I still have it. But Americans knew this. I was out, out in the field with, with, uh, with another sergeant, and, and uh, we walked up on an on a interrogation, and the guy was put, hooking him up a a uh, prisoner to a, a field telephone which runs an electric charge through it and we, he said, well, we don't want to look at that because that's a violation of the Geneva Convention. The fact that we didn't do anything about it is another thing, but, uh, you know, they were our allies. So uh, with that disclaimer, go ahead and ask me anything. <laughs> um, yeah. Well, the Southern Revolutionaries were nominal communists, although people like Douglas Pike called them very bad communists. But they were revolutionaries and nationalists. I, I would ca characterize them primarily. I mean, that runs through all of them. Um, you know, um, there, as far as support, they, you have to remember that the, uh, the Vietnamese resistance to the French, and actually even to the Japanese, and to the French, uh, they, they collected this hodgepodge of a bunch of equipments. They had, they had training and, and base camps, so they, they were familiar with how to fight. I mean, of course, you don't. Going back to Page or um, Douglas Pike's comment about them being the Prussians of Asia, they didn't have to be taught how to fight. They knew how to do that. Um, Well, they provided uh, the uh, Chinese provide ch Chinese provided a lot of uh, of weapons. Although I've talked to some of the Viet Vietnamese who said that this one woman she ran out of gallery. She says she's the Chinese never gave us anything. There's a lot of antipathy towards the Chinese uh, for quite a deliberate reasons too. I mean, they you may recall after the uh, the revolution that Vietnam 
invaded Cambodia, stopped the killing there, and the Chinese didn't like that because they were sort of their surrogate. So the Chinese invaded North Vietnam with uh, multiple divisions and uh, killed a lot of Vietnamese. The Chinese lost a lot of soldiers, but that was to punish the Vietnamese for being disobedient. But again, I, I think it's, it's important to understand that, um, that uh, Vietnam was temporarily partitioned into two zones uh, in 1954 at Geneva. And um, it was supposed to be overcome by nationwide elections, and they didn't happen. Um, uh, and uh, the southern resistance was almost entirely on its own until 1964, so an entire decade where, um, where they had very few uh, means of support from the northern zone uh, uh, of Vietnam uh, until then regular forces come down again. Uh, that had been in the south before 1954 as, as well. Uh, so um, the, this uh, lack of support uh, for the NLF uh, is actually precisely because the revolutionary side did exactly what they had agreed to do at Geneva. They withdrew their armed forces to the northern zone, thinking that they would return two years later after elections. And therefore, the southern resistance was very much on its own for the first decade. And you also have to remember, by 64-65, the government of South Vietnam, RVN, was actually in danger of losing the war. And it wasn't only until there was a little bit more reinforcement from the North and the large scale invasion or, uh, by United States forces uh, landing Marines in Da Nang that sort of stabilized things for the South. I mean, we put a lot of soldiers in there very, very quickly. So. Cliff. What was this operation? I thought it was in the 50s, where we supposedly shipped about a million people from North Vietnam, Vietnam into the South. What was that supposed to achieve? What did it achieve? What do you think? Thank you. Go ahead, Cliff. Well, so the Geneva Accords have three provisions, right? So one is the temporary division into two zones, so not the division of the country into two countries, which is wrong. Uh, which is kind of a myth of Geneva, but just two temporary military recruitment zones. The second provision is that this partition for two years would be overcome by uh, countrywide elections to unify the country again under the winning regime. The third provision was that to, in preparation of the unification elections for one year, civilians could move from north to south or south to north to live under the regime that they wanted to. And there is about 800,000 northerners move south, about 100,000 move north. Um, the motivations are very different. Southern revolutionaries usually did not move north because they were very confident that they would win the elections. And therefore, it was not necessary to move north, whereas northerners were in the majority Catholics and very strongly anti-communist. They saw the writing on the wall. They knew that the communist regime or a pro-communist regime would prevail. And therefore, that's why so many high numbers of northerners uh, moved south in operations that were also logistically supported by the CIA, the United States Navy, and even the Catholic Church of the United States. Mm -hmm. and Ian? I have an anecdote for that. Um, I'm the youngest. I have family from the north and from the south. And uh, um, I have uh, heard that in the north, people, um, some some parishes in the north, the um, the parish priests yeah. told the population that or told their congregation that um, Jesus and Mary will stop. So we gotta go. <laughs> <laughs> so that's word of mouth. I just heard that um, from people um, that I talked to. Now the, this piece this next part is um, fact. The US government um brought down um, in the north money, um, the, the, the local money at the time, but a 
Take us back 50 years and tell us what it was like for you being very young and going through that intense military training, and now you're, you're facing the alleged enemy. Did you have respect for that individual as a fellow soldier fighting for a different country, or did you have anger that you had to resolve in order to do your job? And if so, how did you do that? Well, I, I never had any anger. I was a soldier, and I just looked at a pretty straightforward sort of thing. But the, the, uh, you have to remember too that I was trained for five months as an intelligence analyst, which is sort of like a, a super file clerk. And after I finished that training, they said, "Okay, now we're going to make an interrogator out of you." And so they sent me to. Uh, we had a four-week, three-week course. You're an interrogator. And our instructors in this, <laughs> these interrogator instructors, well, most of them were Eastern European DPs who were uh, joined the American Army. They're Polish, German, uh, Czech, uh, who kind of disliked each other quite a bit, German. And they were teaching us how to be an interrogators. And they, they, did, they did things like uh, slam books down on the, on the desk and that sort of thing. It was just, had no re re relevance to what we were actually doing in, in Vietnam. Uh, and after that experience, I went to language school. And I was not a good student. So by the time I got to Vietnam, even after months, my Vietnamese was, um, well, OK. But you have to remember sort of, sort of the, the basic sort of questions of, of, uh, that you were asking a, 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 a soldier, a, a prisoner of war. You only needed maybe 500 words. Like, how many, what was your battalion? What kind of weapons did you have? Where did you go? Where did you come from? Who was your commanding officer? That's sort of the, the nuts and bolts. So, I mean, we weren't having any Zen discussion about Buddhism. <laughs> it was all nuts and bolts interrogation. And, you know, after a while, you became familiar with that kind of terminology. But I was always impressed with how, how uh, forthright uh, these people were. I mean, they, if they told me something, I, I write it down. I mean, who was I to say that what they were saying wasn't true? We just generally knew how many soldiers were out there, where they were generally. So it wasn't like that they were going to tell me something I didn't know. Uh, uh, so I mean, I, uh, I talked to a bunch of Chu Hoys, which is they called it the Open Arms Program, of um, which they called were returnees, but basically deserters from the either Pavin or NLF, and. Uh, they were they they joined the uh, the army because they they were tired of fighting for one thing, and uh, they sometimes got some money for it. Often they were they were funneled into the Arvin army too as Kit Carson scouts. So I mean I was impressed with them as their competence. I, there was no uh, understood. We were all soldiers and we understand what we were supposed to be doing, and uh, I didn't feel any anger. I mean I felt quite a bit of anger seeing what we did to that village next door. But I also knew that as a soldier, I could have been a door gunner or a, a pilot doing the same thing. That's what the sort of common denominator in war is, is that you're uh, basically you're going to be killing some people. Yeah, Before Tony. Died, you speak up. Before <laughs> yeah. So generally, did they answer your questions willingly? Yeah, well, I mean, you have to realize that they were captured. They were at a jail, and they weren't going anyplace. 
and uh, we all sort of knew the, the drill was is that you, you, you talk, I mean, they're not not going to talk. And, but then again, they all had about a half a dozen aliases and the information that they were giving, they, they, they tended not to give information that you didn't already know and they knew you didn't know. You know. So it was sort of like this, uh, it's an odd sort of, uh, occasionally you'd, you'd run across them, but most of the stuff was not, um, I mean, really in the context of the war, it wasn't that important to tell you the truth. <laughs> the big, the big uh, uh, piece of information which the United States lied about and they knew about was that there was a hell of a lot more confident combat soldiers out there with the NLF than they were willing to admit there were. That was the part that never got upstream. Well, it was, it was it was uh, for me to an analyst in the uh, to the uh, uh, senior analysts. You know, they knew that there's a uh, Sam Adams who was a CIA uh, inter uh, uh, analyst and interrogator, and he went to bat. And he says he was looking at this this uh, this information. This intelligence analyst that says, "Look at he says the stuff that your guys are keeping double books here. This is what we know to be a fact." And this is what you're putting out to the president and you're, you're, uh, the public and says you're telling commanders says that we're, we're killing all these people. And he said, well, they added it up. He says, well, you would have killed these entire cadre of, of, the, of the NLF twice now. So Sam Adams went to the bat. He was kicked out of the CIA or just forced to leave the CIA. A good book called War of Numbers. And it, it's all about that sort of, uh, that particular part. Yeah, the critical part of the war, really. Uh, and. Uh, you may recall Westmoreland sued uh, a CBS, I think. They took him, he took, he was taken, taken to court because CBS basically reported this as, as fact, and it was fact. When it came to push, come to shove, going to, going to court over it, Westmoreland backed off because they were new there. They actually had some people like myself who actually, and, and the other senior analysts who knew that this was the fact. You can't lie about this sort of thing. One of the guys who was actually the senior uh, uh, intelligence agency, Christian, uh, who was Westmoreland's chief of staff, uh, intelligence chief of staff, and West Christian, Christian said to Westmoreland, he says, you can't do this. This is not, this is not correct. He said, you're out of here. He kicked him back to the States. So, I mean, they knew who they were dealing with. They lied to the American public. I mean, that's not new news, but. Um, okay. However, there's going to be a book signing. You can continue asking your questions. Michael, Christoph, uh, thank you so much. You have an extraordinary story to tell and an extraordinary book. So thank you very much for being here. Thank you all for coming. Thank you. Out.